But let me begin. In war resolution, in defeat, defiance, in victory, magnanimity, and in peace, goodwill. These words are on the frontispiece of Churchill's magnificent history of the Second World War. But it's an apt description of the character and foresight of three great leaders in three successive centuries. George Washington in the 18th century, Abraham Lincoln in the 19th century, and Winston S. Churchill in the 20th. Each of these men was born within a decade of the passing of his predecessor. Each held his predecessor in high regard for his leadership, tenacity, and character. And each cast a long shadow for succeeding generations. George Washington became the father of his country because he represented the noble democratic American, a strong-willed, skilled soldier who spoke softly and fought bravely. Abraham Lincoln kept the flame of liberty burning brightly as he spoke decisively, giving voice to the principles of freedom and democracy. And Winston Churchill, the half-American and all-British bulldog who stood alone in opposition to perhaps the most vile and despotic regime to have ever threatened the freedoms that all free people hold dear. All three spent long years out of the limelight until a national crisis propelled them back into the arena. For Washington, it was Shays' rebellion and the failure of the Articles of Confederation. For Lincoln, it was a national crisis resulting from the threat of spreading slavery and the dissolution of the Union. And for Churchill, it was the outbreak of World War II. All three men believed that they had been prepared by experience and appointed by history to confront the task before them, a task that was nothing less than the salvation of freedom and the maintenance of a constitutional government. Although each of these men relied heavily on his own experience, and those experiences were manifest, they were all students of history. But learning from the past without living in the past, that's a difficult challenge. In a letter to John Armstrong, George Washington advised we should not look back unless it's to profit and derive useful lessons from past errors for the purposes of profiting by dearly bought experience. Churchill once advised a young American, a friend of mine actually, James Humes, who stood outside number 10 on one cold rainy day waiting for Churchill to emerge. And he said, Mr. Churchill, Mr. Churchill, please tell us the secret of your success. And Churchill responded with, study history. Study history, for in it lie all the secrets of statecraft. In the field of human events, Lincoln was the natural successor to George Washington as Churchill was to Abraham Lincoln. Their names have become synonymous with the struggle against great odds and with hope in times of gathering storms. Their legacy reminds us that the political principles that form the root of our character and the political principles that form the freedom that are the basis of freedom loving nations must be followed, promoted, and defended. Character, boldness, and determination. Those are the hallmarks of leadership. Character to do what's right. Boldness to be willing to stand alone when necessary. And determination to never give in. Never, 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 never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to the overwhelming might of the enemy and never yield to force. These principles, these marvelous words apply equally to each of these three great men. Having the character and integrity to do what's right in the face of great pressures to the contrary has always been admired but it's not always been appreciated. Many of us often talk a good game on this trait, but we seldom measure up to it when the chips are down. We love it when public officials stand tall, but only when they stand tall for what we happen to believe. We love it when our elected officials cast an unpopular vote, 
but only when that unpopular vote is one with which we agree. And we love it when, our, when those elected officials march to a different drummer, but only when we hear the same music. That's human nature, I suppose, but in these three men, it was the strength of their individual character. It is said that to know the United States of America, one must know George Washington. He was truly the indispensable man. Winston Churchill pointed out in his four-volume history of the English-speaking people that it was no easy task for Washington, for Washington to simply have kept his army in existence during those years. It is probably Washington's greatest contribution to the Patriot cause, for no other American could have done as much. Churchill went on to write, George Washington holds one of the proudest titles that history can bestow. He is the father of his country. Almost alone, his staunchness in the war for independence held the American colonies to their united purpose. Churchill was born to British nobility, but he was the son of a second son. He gained no unearned advantage. He was known to have rehearsed his speeches standing in front of a large portrait of one of his heroes, George Washington. Imagine for a moment what advice may have quietly passed between the two. Interestingly, in 1952, Winston Churchill was inducted into the Society of the Cincinnati. Churchill qualified for membership thanks to the fact that his great-great-grandfather, Lieutenant Reuben Murray of Connecticut, had marched with George Washington. President Dwight Eisenhower quoted Churchill as saying that although my father was British, my mother was American, and my ancestors were officers in Washington's army, I am myself an English-speaking Union. <laughs> Churchill wrote, I am a child of the House of Commons. I was brought up in my father's house to believe in democracy. Trust the people. That was the message. Therefore, I've been in full harmony all of my life with the tides which have flowed on both sides of the Atlantic against privilege and monopoly, and I have steered confidently towards the Gettysburg ideal of government by the people, for the people, and of the people. In my country as in yours, Public men are proud to be the servants of the state and would be ashamed to be its masters. Churchill recognized excellence in the constitutional forms of many nations, but particularly the United States, in attaining the ends to which they were created. While many different arrangements have been tried, Churchill noted, all such constitutions have the same object in view. Namely, that the persistent resolve of the people shall prevail without throwing the community into convulsion or disorder by rash or violent action, irreparable action, and to restrain and to prevent a group, sect, or faction from assuming dictatorial power. Churchill noted that different arrangements can be directed at the same object. Democracy is not a caucus. Obtaining a fixed term of office by promising and doing whatever it pleases. We hold that there ought to be a constant relationship between the rulers and the people. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people still remains the sovereign definition of democracy. The words character and integrity, which I mentioned a few minutes ago, are often synonymous, synonymous with the name Abraham Lincoln. Born less than a decade after the passing of the great George Washington, Abraham Lincoln embodied Washington's determination to champion liberty. Churchill believed himself to have much in common with Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln specifically with regard to their mutual belief in the sovereignty of the people. He wished always to dwell on the essential political harmony of the two nations, the United States and Great Britain, insisting that our differences are more apparent than real and are the result of geographical and other physical conditions rather than any true division of the people. Churchill noted that law, language, and literature unite the English-speaking world and all other sorts of things are happening which fortify these mighty traditions with ever-growing practical considerations of safety and survival. 
the rule of law, calm without prejudice, swayed neither to the right nor to the left, however political tides or party currents may flow, is the foundation of freedom. The independence of the judiciary from the executive is the prime defense against the tyranny and retrogression of totalitarian government. Trial by jury, the right of every man to be judged by his equals is among the most precious gifts that England has bequeathed to America. Now here are the vital questions which define the freedoms we all seek. Is there the right to free expression of opinion and of opposition and criticism of the government? Have people the right to turn out a government for which they disapprove? Are constitutional means provided by which they can make their will known? Are the courts of justice free from interference by the executive and from threats of mob violence? Are they free of all association with particular political parties? Will these courts administer open and well-established laws which are associated with the broad principles of decency and justice? Will there be fair play for poor as well as rich and for private persons as well as government officials? Will the rights of the individual subject to his duties to the state be maintained and asserted? Is the ordinary workman who is earning a living by daily toil and striving to bring up a family free from fear that some grim police organization under the control of a single party will tap him on the shoulder and pack him off without fair or open trial? George Washington was of the same mind 150 years earlier when he wrote, the basis of our political system is the right of the people to make and to alter their constitutional government. Washington, Lincoln, and Churchill opposed injustice and, human in, and inhumanity of any sort. At the core of their understanding of statesmanship was an unceasing call to the world to build upon healthy political principles, especially those that are the legacies of the Anglo-American tradition. The price of greatness is responsibility. One cannot rise in many ways to be the leading community of the civilized world without being involved in its problems, without being convulsed by its agonies, and, and inspired by its causes. I'm often asked what I believe the greatest trait of leadership. I think that we should all give that question considerable thought. Churchill himself once said, courage is rightly esteemed the first of all human qualities because it is the quality that makes all others possible. But it is also said that courage for some great act of bravery, perhaps in the heat of, in the heat of battle, we all admire. But there is that still more rare courage which can sustain repeated disappointment unexpected failure, and even shattering defeat. Great leaders come back again and again and spend themselves in a worthy cause. This was the courage of a Washington, a Lincoln, and a Churchill. We have also heard of the sublime ad admonition of forgiveness. In my view, there is no glory in war and there is no victory in retribution. That too is a trait mutually held by these three great men. It is the magnanimity of our Anglo-American heritage that allows us to move forward into the broad sunland uplands of the future. In the post-revolutionary war era, Washington himself warned against aggravating the patriot loyalist divide as it would destabilize the new nation. He backed Alexander Hamilton's defense of loyalists being, who were being threatened with loss of property in New York City. As the Civil War waned, Abraham Lincoln told his generals, let them up easy. This was reflected in his 10% plan for Reconstruction. Winston Churchill told an audience regarding the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I that their desire to punish Germany would result only in an armistice and not in a peace treaty. The idea that the vanquished could pay the expenses of the victors 
he told a national television audience, was a destructive and crazy delusion. It will only foment another war, which it did. We are now living in highly charged days of political campaigns and great partisan divides, punctuated by finger pointing, finger wagging, and always an assignment of blame. I would like to think that when this period ends, of course, if it ever ends, that, there, that we can and we shall come together for our mutual benefit. Washington endured great privation, stunning defections and demoralizing defeats. But when the war ended, he returned to his home, satisfied that he had given his all and lived by no man's leave. Lincoln called upon us to come together as a nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And Churchill, even when turned out of office by the very people he had saved from a tyranny greater than men had ever experienced, asked no retribution, but postulated we must never cease to proclaim in fearless tones the great principles of freedom and the rights of man which are the joint inheritances of the English-speaking world and which through the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights, the habeas corpus, trial by jury, English common law, and in their most famous expression, the Declaration of Independence. In his essay, Mass Effects in Modern Life, Churchill wrote, why are we here? What is the purpose of life? No material progress can bring comfort to the human soul and this fact gives us the best hope that all will be well. No matter what happens, our hearts will ache if we do not have vision above material things. It is vital that moral philosophy and spiritual conceptions of men and nations should hold their own amid, amid these formidable and scientific evolutions. As Churchill's life was nearing his end, or its end, his youngest daughter, Mary, said to her father, in addition to all the feelings a daughter has for a loving and generous father, I owe you what every English man, woman, and child does, liberty itself. President Eisenhower wrote in the Churchill I knew, on that gray and moving winter day, when his soul was committed to the hands of God and stately pageant, amid stately pageantry, I knelt in St. Paul's Cathedral. Around me were old flags, old shields, old prayers, all the evidence of Britain's long continuity. And I wondered if we in the United States, with our devotion to the new at the expense of the old, to the future at the expense of the past, are not forsaking something precious. For only a nation steeped in history and pride could produce a Churchill. Such words are most fitting for us today as we reflect on the memory and the contribution and impact on our lives of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Winston Churchill. The fact that each has passed away is unimportant for we all shall pass away. But the fact that each lived is momentous to the destiny of decent people. They are gone. They are not gone. They live wherever people are free. Thank you very much.